didn't have my microphone on. That was, huh. If you'd bow with me this morning, I want to open us up in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, our God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, of letting us be in your house. And Lord, I just thank you for the people that's here. And I thank you most of all for the spirit that's with us, Lord, your spirit. And Father God, I just thank you for the reality of the truths that we just sang, God. And, and Lord, I just pray, Lord, today that we build our hope on that firm foundation, Lord, that you promised you will never let the righteous fall. What an awesome promise, God. And I just ask you to help me cling to that with all I have. And I pray that everybody here does. And Father God, all of us here have a past that needs to be rewritten in some way. Lord, we can't change the past, but you can write the future in the way that glorifies you if we'll let you. And I pray, Father God, that we do that today. Lord, I just pray today that this message might bring deliverance, Father God. And, and what, what some would perceive as condemnation, Lord, I pray that you open their eyes to the reality that it is salvation. And Lord, I pray that you help me understand more and more every day what you have done for me. I just ask, Lord, that if there's one among us that's lost, that they might have their eyes open, that they may truly understand salvation. And, and Father God, for those that are in Christ, Lord, I, if there's something that needs to be brought to light, Lord, bring it to light. Bring revival to the church, Father God. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get started, I was going to, uh, I was, uh, John mentioned earlier they, that the things you can do during the crusade. They got a lot of things going on. One thing that they do want is 150 counselors to be able to go down uh, and talk to people that come down about salvation. Sounds like a real hard job, really not a hard job. Uh, if you have found Jesus as your Lord, then you're qualified to take somebody else to him. That's the one qualification you got to have. If you feel led to be a counselor, they're going to train you on some things to say. They're going to give you some things to walk through. If they say this, you say that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? They're going to take a whole lot of the worry out of it. And it can always, always, if somebody asks you a question you don't know, you can always revert back to saying, I don't know. But we'll go over here and see if we can find somebody that does, if you will follow me. And uh, so that they would love uh, for to have that. But be praying it up. There's a lot of things going on. There's, uh, there's going to be, uh, after the crusade is over, it will have only begun. That's when the church has to follow up and, and reach these people that really uh, reached out for Christ during the crusade. With that being said, I don't say this very often, but I'd like to say it this morning. Uh, we have, uh, and we're going to talk about some deep stuff in the next coming weeks. And I want to say something right now that I've said before, but I haven't said it often enough. When I got saved, I was in a terrible situation in my life. Men mentally, I was in a terrible place to be. And, and I got saved. I started going to church, man. I'd go to churches, uh, I'd go to Wednesday night service, Sunday night service, they had a revival, I'd go, I'd go to churches where people would look at me like an illegitimate kid at a family reunion, you know, I mean, they, they, they'd say, what in the world is this dude doing at our church, and I didn't care, because I wasn't there for them, you know, what I mean, but, but I can honestly say that church changed my life. Because it gave me a people to be plugged into that made me better when I was plugged into a people that made me worse. Our church got a lot of stuff going on. We got, we got a great Sunday school. We got Sunday night service. We got Wednesday night service. We got kids programs. If you're looking to get plugged in and you don't know how, I'd love to talk to you about it. Ask some other people that you see that look and say, how, how can I get more involved? But I want you to be more involved. If there's something that you say, I want to do something for God, we got all kinds of opportunities. All you got to do is, want, you know, there's lots of ways to serve in the church. So if you want to know more about that, we'd love to have. This morning, in the early service, I did have no idea that she was going to do this, but Miss Sherry Goins led our praise music, and she led us in the praise song, Hosanna. Has it? Hosanna. Oh, it's good. And I hadn't heard that song in years. I had no idea she was going to sing it. And when she did, it gave me the willies because it went along so good with the day's message. Whenever Jesus was going into Jerusalem in the triumphant entry is where Hosanna comes into the scene in the scripture. Jesus is going into Jerusalem. And he's riding along on that donkey. You remember that part of the story? He's riding along on that donkey. 
and fulfillment is going to happen that day. This is the day that he will be proclaimed as the one. And people start taking their jackets off, laying them out in the middle of the road. They start gathering up palm branches, and they start hollering, Hosanna, son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna. And the Pharisees come out there and say, you've got to quieten these people down. They're causing a scene. And Jesus says something that gives me cold chills. If they stop, the rocks will scream my name. It was the day for Hosanna to be screamed because the word Hosanna means save us now. Save us now. Let me ask you something. How many of those people that was screaming Hosanna really understood what he was doing? None. Let me ask you something. When you got saved the day you said Hosanna for the first time, Jesus save me now. Jesus, be my Lord. Did you fully understand what you were signing up for? Well, no, that's where faith comes in. You trusted Christ as Lord. But I really didn't even understand what I was getting saved from exactly. I knew that I was in a mess. I knew that sin had come over my life. I knew that I was going to go to hell without him. I was lost and empty and broken. The preacher said you could have peace and joy and hope and mercy. And I never felt those things in my life. And I said, if you can have them, you tell me how because I want them. I'm sick of being sick. You show me where I got to go and what I got to do. And he said, you call on the name of Jesus to be your Lord and you can have them. And I did. And I'm still trying to figure out exactly what it's all about. But I'm saved. How many people would love to go back? And understand that day what you understand today. Isn't that a, and I want to tell you something. In 10 years from now, you'll understand even more if you stay in tune with Jesus. Because we're understanding more and more and more all the time, right? And that's why today's message is so important to me. Because there are times in my life when I would have perceived today's message as condemnation. I would have heard a message like today from a preacher and I would have humped up like a cat. I would have thought that it was a message of condemnation and he was pointing his fingers at me. And man, I, I, I wouldn't have perceived it well. I wouldn't let the Holy Spirit respond to me. I mean, I wouldn't have responded to the Holy Spirit because my heart was hard. But I soon understand that what I thought was condemnation actually was salvation. Jesus wasn't throwing any rocks at my sin. He was trying to free me from my sin. What I thought was good, he understood was not. Can anybody raise their hand and say that the things they had such a hard time letting go of, they wouldn't take back for nothing in the world? Whoo! I tell you what, the things I thought I couldn't do without, after I got rid of them, you couldn't give them back to me. Man, that is, that is salvation, isn't it not? Jesus knowed I didn't need it, but I didn't want to let go. And he kept saying, son, if you don't let go of that, you can't have me. And I'm thinking, this ain't fair. I like it. Because he knows more than me. And so if you're here today, understand something. Jesus come for salvation, not condemnation. Please understand that. We're going to read 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. But before I read it, I want to remind you of John's words and. First Peter, I mean, First John chapter 2, verse 1. John says, dear children, I write this to you so that you do not sin. John said, I, I, I want you to understand something. I love you, and I want to help you out. The, this is the word of God, and I'm telling you this because I love you, and I'm telling you this so that you don't bite the same hook you just bit the last time. They say you can't catch the same fish twice, but I've done it. Some fish are stupider than others. I throwed a fish out and throwed out again and caught him a second time and picked him up and said, you are one stupid fish. You know what I'm talking about? You remind me of me, buddy. This has got a hook in this world. You can catch the same fish twice because I've went to the bank on Satan's hook a lot of times. You know what I mean? Same bait, same hook, same style, same way the last time was. And here I go again. Thinking, God, you are so stupid. John said, I, I'm telling you this so you can be set free. But if you do sin, he said, if you do sin, we have a Jesus Christ, a mediator that's between us and God. He'll make restitution for you. This is what he says in 1 John 2, 15. They're going to put it on the wall right up here. We began 
we ended here last week, we're beginning here to this day. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Can we leave that verse on the wall? Is that possible to leave that up there? Good, because we're going to talk about that in just a moment. This is what he says. He says that everything that originated of the world, that didn't originate of God, but of the world, is in direct opposition of God. And listen to this. You can't love God and love the world. And you can't love the world and love God. If you're doing both of them, you're lying to one of them. And it'll always be to God. Because it's an impossibility to love God and love the world. It's an impossibility. If you're in love with the world, then you've lied to God. If you said you loved him. That's what John says. And man, that right there is hard. Because he said everything that evolved from this old, ugly, sinful world. Everything that originated with this world. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. Every bit of it is not from God. But from the world. Three major categories of sin he listed. We're going to start talking about them. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. All that junk is not from God. But from the world. All of it. And, and then listen to what he says in this beautiful verse. The world and its desires pass away. Everything that the world says it can give you has got a shelf life on it. Right? I want to tell you something. The world is on death row. It's dying. It's burning up. It's all got an ending date. It's on death row. Everything of the world's on death row, and everybody in love with the world is on death row. They will die with the world if it's the world they love. But those who do the will of God, let's get what it says right there. They'll live forever. You understand why it was so important for Jesus to get everybody to understand why they had to loosen their grip on the world? We, we look at it and we say, that's not fair. You're mean. How can you pick on my sin? Jesus wasn't picking on anybody's sin. He come to get them free from their sin. But you can't have freedom from something you're in love with until you choose not to love it anymore. I heard a fellow say, name's Paul Washer. He said, when you get saved, you'll find yourself loving the things you used to hate and hating the things you used to love. All of a sudden, your mindset's going to change. And the things that you used to be so in love with, the world, you're going to hate them. And the things that you used to live in hatred of, the things of God, you're going to love them. If Jesus truly becomes your Lord. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Because this right here is something I believe we must understand before we go any farther. Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to read you verses 5 down to 7. No, I ain't right. I think I'm going to read the eight, but just follow along till I get done. <laughs> Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires. And those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Now, how many people are readers in this group? I could not raise my hand on this question. <laughs> when you start the book, you got to finish it. You're a reader. You're an end-to-end -end reader. I mean, when you get on it, when you get hooked, you're going to the end. You know, I'm how many people are readers when it comes to books? We got some of you. And I want to tell you something that's cool as it can be to be a reader. I've never been one, but I know it's got to be cool. But the problem is sometimes when we get deep in Scripture, and I mean I'm talking about in heavy-duty Scripture like Romans chapter 8, what happens is, is for a reader, we get hooked up and we go to the other end. And the time we get there, we don't even know what we read because we just went right straight through and we didn't even really ponder on the things it actually said. And I want to tell you something, a lot of times in stuff like Romans chapter 8, 
It's, it, I told Ricky this about ministry, and I want you to try to grasp this. A nail drove all the way in will hold a whole lot more than three drove halfway. Sometimes we don't get the point all the way home, and we just absolutely miss it. it we miss it. Listen to what he's saying. There are some words in the passage that I just read that I really want to draw your attention to. And the one that I want to draw your attention to the most is the word controlled. The mind controlled by the spirit. Now I want you to, I want you to think about something for a minute. What does it mean to have a mind controlled by the spirit? I don't want you to tell me. I want you to come up with your answer. What does it mean to have a mind controlled by the spirit? Those who have their minds controlled by the Spirit. Because this is heavy stuff, folks. See, a lot of times as Christians, we think that the person whose mind is controlled by the Spirit is absent from temptation. That the spiritual mind is in little spiritual la-la land with God and nothing bad ever enters into the spiritual mind. Ah, wrong, 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 wrong. James 1 14 they're gonna shoot it right up on the wall right there if you got your Bible open to Romans 8 you stay right there James 1 14 says but each person is tempted when they are dragged away and enticed by their own evil desire they are dragged away and enticed by evil desire now that word let me find my paperwork that word in the Greek and my Greek is really rusty I, I mean rusty is uh Epithomia, epithomia, or epithomia is that word in the Greek. And that, that word means to have a longing for forbidden things. The, the word evil desire there, it, it, it means to have a longing for evil things. You are enticed by your longing for evil things. And you could say, oh, I don't have a longing for evil things. I'm a righteous man. I'm a righteous woman. <laughs> you tell somebody else this because this old boy here ain't bad. I done got down that. Now. That ain't going to work because you're human. Then you have a sinful desire. Everybody was born with one. You tell a little kid, don't open that door. Whatever you do, don't open that door. You have just dared them to open that door. You may not have meant to, but you have made it their number one life goal to find out what's behind that door right there. They're going to do it. Ain't that right? When I was in school, the coolest thing to do was whatever they said not to do. Is that not what happened when you were there? My, back in school, I smoked, you know. And, and, and figuring out creative ways to smoke at school was like the number one ambition while we was there. And we come up with all kinds of cool ways to do it and not get caught. They, they had some salt feeders behind the egg shop. And, the, and me and Jim Bob sat in them salt feeders and smoked cigarettes between every class. Every class never got caught. They was down there looking for them other dummies in the bathroom. We was out there making small talk, smoking cigarettes in the salt feeder. You know what I'm talking about? And, and laughing at them. <laughs> They said not to smoke. Look at us. We've smoked a carton this week. <laughs> it become the cool thing not to do because it was the forbidden thing. Right? Right? We all got a sin nature. And, and guess what? The greatest things to do are seeming to be the things that God forbade. Why is it that Satan is not worried about you doing the things of God? He never tempts you to do the things of God, right? No, your sin nature is always going away from God. It says that your sin nature is in direct opposition to God. Have you ever noticed that? The things that your sinful nature longs for is the very things God said, do not do. And so all of a sudden, i got to have my mind controlled by God. But it doesn't mean that God's going to zap me and take away my sinful desire. A lot of people, and this is the reason why this message means so much to me, because lately I've heard people say these words, brother, it ain't working for me. I say, what well, ain't working for you? This whole God thing, it ain't working for me. 
I have prayed and I have prayed and I have prayed. And I still got a crazy, I still, I still got the desire to drink. I still got the desire to, for lust. It ain't working for me. And I say, you missed it. Whoo, you must have understood what God wanted to give you. It, God never said he was going to zap you and take away your desire. He said it was through the Holy Spirit that he would empower you to control that desire in a godly way. That you would put to death the misdeeds of the body through the Spirit. And through the Spirit you would live a life that was glorified to God. How many people in this room, you don't have to raise your hand because all we in the church are crowd. How many people in this room every day of your life have the temptation to do the wrong thing? Of course you do. If you're honest. Of course you do. We all do. We have the temptation to do the wrong thing. And our mind is always going to be the battleground for Satan. He wouldn't have, well, how would you even ever do the wrong thing if it didn't cross your mind? Right? And so every test you ever face, there's going to be something cross your mind that you shouldn't do. Every single one. And so if you're praying for God to take the temptation away, he's not going to. So give up on that. And ask him to give you the strength to overcome the temptation. Ask him to deliver you through the Holy Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the body like he said he would do. Let me ask you another question. How could you say it's not working? God's making good on every promise from Eden to Zion. And you're saying that he can't make his promise come true for you? No, 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 no. We're missing it. God wanted to give us freedom from sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, it's, it's, it's bigger than we understand. And, and so today I want to talk to you about categories of sin. And I want to begin. Today we're going to talk about the lust of the flesh. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but the lust of the flesh is the, for the things that, you've, that you have inside the body. The lust of the eyes is for the things outside the body. But the lust of the flesh is for the things inside the body. And I'm going to give you three major examples of the lust of the flesh. Love, nourishment, and intimacy. All right? Love, nourishment, and and intimacy. How many people could give the nod that all three of those things should be righteous things? Love, nourishment, and intimacy. Right? God, God calls every one of them a blessing in his word. Every single one of those three in his word is a blessing. How is it that Satan is destroying people's lives by the desire of a righteous thing fulfilled in a perverted way and making it an evil thing. You, you follow me? What I'm saying is the things that we desire start out as righteous things, but Satan perverts our desire and we end up feeling them in an unrighteous way. And so I want to talk to you about them a little bit. First of all, I want to bless God for the temperature. I thought it's going to be cold and I'm about to burn up. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. No, no. This right here is what I wanted to say, though. Love. Let me think about it. Everybody wants to be loved, right? You were created to be loved. Now, let me, let me run this through your mind for a minute. Follow me if you would. Is it amazing that our desire for love takes us away from God, but God is love? You understand how sick Satan is? Our desire for love, Satan perverts our desire so much that our desire for love, our longing for love takes us away from God. When actually God is love. You know the old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. I want to tell you something. Everybody in this room could raise their hand if they was honest and say you have looked for love in wrong places. Let me give you an example. A young lady, a young lady wants to be loved. Now, there's a lot of us in this room that have been married long enough that we have once in a while slipped into the place where you don't give a rip where your significant other notices you or not. You don't have to raise your hand, but if you don't, you're a liar if you've been married very long because it's hard to keep the flame burning high. You know, every once in a while, you got to put a log on the fire. It'll, it'll whittle her on you. But every young girl... Most of the time got to a place in her life where her life's ambition was feeling like she was to the attention of some young man. Now, 
come on, honey, this ain't no funeral, girls. You're going to have to testify. See, Crystal, give me the There you go, right there. There's some young girls in this, in this world, a lot of them. I got two little girls scaring me to death. And it becomes their life's ambition to be loved by some little boy. Oh, he's cute. He's cute. You know, I don't really know what that's supposed to look like in a boy, but I hear girls saying that all the time. He is cute. You know what I mean? And it becomes so much of their drive to get the attention of this young man. But how does the world tell them they have to do it? Negotiate their morality. You got to negotiate your morality. In order to get his attention, you have to fulfill his desire. Well, his desire is perverted by Satan. We're going to get to that in intimacy in a minute. So in order to get him to love you, you got to negotiate your morality so you can meet his desire. And so you're looking for love by negotiating your morality, which is denying God and loving the world. And so right there, you're looking for love has took you away from God. You don't have to raise your hand, girls, but I know there's girls in this room that can say, I've been there and done that. I know that. Hey, I got married for all the right reasons. My wife's sitting right there. I wouldn't trade her for nothing in this world. When I married her, my mind was about as screwed up as anybody's, and I got married for all the wrong reasons, and that's the God's truth. God took what was meant for evil and turned it into good, but that's on God. But Derek, he, I wasn't looking for right things, and that's the God's truth. What about a young boy? I want to tell you something. Love for a young boy is about as strong as a young girl. When I was a kid, I would have run my head through a brick wall to hear my daddy say, son, you done good. Right? You, little, you, you know what it was like to be a boy and to hear somebody break? Every little boy wants to see the ball go over the fence and the crowd go wild. Every little boy wants to be a home run hitter. Every one of them. And they want to hear somebody say, you done good. And when it gets a little later on in life, they want to become the hero in some little girl's fantasy. Now, you could say not, but I want to tell you something. I always wanted to be Prince Charming for some hot chick. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let's double up right off in the sunset, baby. You know what I mean? Every little boy did. Let's be honest. Come on here. Love will get you in a lot of trouble if you pervert what love is. What about parents? With their kids. I see parents negotiating their morality because their kids get to the place in their life where they start going away from God. And their parents worry their kids won't love them if they stand up to that. And so they start negotiating their morality and swinging with their kids. How in the world is that love? If I believe that God could save my kids' soul, then how in the world am I loving them by saying, oh, you don't have to worry about that. I wasn't serious about all that God stuff. I won't mention it anymore. I love you. Please be my baby. You see what I mean? And so all of a sudden, our mindset of love is to tell everybody what they want to hear and do whatever they want us to do. Folks, that's not love. That's lies. Satan has took the most beautiful thing, love, and made it take us away from God rather than to God because he perverted our desire. What about the young lady or the young man that was raised in abuse? How are they even supposed to know what love looks like? Do you know that it's proven fact that a young lady raised in an abusive home almost always marries an abusive husband? Do you know that? Why? Because until she gets a hold of this, she ain't never going to know what love looks like. And all of a sudden, when Jesus sets her free, she says, wait a minute. All the things I thought was love, that ain't love. And then she knows what love is, right? Folks, you get off this course right here, you ain't got much. What about nourishment? Oh. If I ask you to define to me what gluttony was, you would say. Eating too much. Got one honest man in the room, the rest of them saying, oh, man, I'm hung here. Sucking in, you know. <laughs> Gluttony's eating too much. I ain't even going to ask for a show of hands. Yeah. But does it make any sense? No, I don't make no sense. And your stomach's saying, man, we can't do no more. Please, please don't eat no more. And your taste bud's saying, let's get one more piece of that chocolate pie. You know, and the stomach's saying, it's got to go somewhere. 
you ain't ever went to the steakhouse on Sunday afternoon and hated yourself by 3 o'clock? By gosh, I've done it a many times. And all you can eat buffet can become a curse. Right? Gluttony. Gluttony. And why do we want it? Why do we want somebody hit the nail on the head? Why do we do that? Chasing the feeling, right? Oh, it tastes so good. We'll worry about the effects later. I'll puke when I get home, but it tastes so good. It tastes good, right? Ain't that right? How many people have been with the crowd that said, don't depend on me in the morning? I'll be sicker than a dog in the morning. I'm getting drunk tonight. Man, when you're planning on getting sick in the morning, something's wrong. Why do we do it? Because it feels good, right? It is a desperately hopeless move to reach peace for a moment. Just a little bit of peace. Just knock the edge off. Just a little bit of peace. A little bit of joy for a moment. But we know it's going to be misery. That's what Jesus said. My word, my truth will set you free. You don't have to do that anymore. If that's the only kind of joy you ever feel... You ain't never felt joy. He said, I'll give you joy the world can't take away. I'll give you joy you can have the next morning. I'll give you joy you can have. I love this verse. Jesus said, he that hungers and thirsts for righteousness will be filled. You ever seen a glutton ever get full? No. Ain't never been a glutton get full. Maybe for a moment, but not for long. It's an endless, hopeless love for something that will never fill us up. What about drunkenness? Isn't it amazing that the Bible calls wine a blessing and a curse? It calls wine a mocker. And it says not to be a man of too much wine. But it also says God blessed us with wine to gladden our heart. What's, what, 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 so where do you wrap your mind around all that? Do we take what God meant for blessing and turn it into evil? Yeah, that's what we've done. Because, and here's the thing. Some people say, oh, you down on, you down on alcohol. Oh, yeah. And man, they'll throw up a hedge right now and say, hey, I love my beer. Don't be coming in here dissing alcohol. Right? I ain't down on alcohol. I'm not preaching against you, beer. I'm going to ask you a question. How many times in your life has everybody got out one, took the top off, and glorified God? Because when you start, it's all right. Jesus turned the water into wine, thank God for it, and they sit around praising God while he's drinking a glass of wine. Wasn't no hell raising going on. Everybody kept their shirt on. Went home with the right women. You see what I mean? God was glorified. Their language was godly. Can it not happen? Yes, it can happen. It can be that way. But our mentality takes something that should be okay and turns it into sin. And so right there, right there, we have got to judge in our mind. God, am I glorifying you with this or am I not? And if I'm not glorifying God with it, I don't need it. What about intimacy? Oh, man. I'm tell you something, it's hard to stand in the front on this right here. Because we live in a society, when you say the word intimacy in a church setting, people go, oh, what's he going to say? Little Johnny's here. I'm going to tell you something, little Johnny's going to be on the school bus. In the morning, little Johnny's going to be on the school bus, and he's going to hear about things you don't know about yet. So you better start talking to little Johnny about the way God wrote the book because somebody else is going to rewrite it for him. I mean, is intimacy good? You dang right it's good. Amen. God created intimacy to be good. Do you realize that there's a, a nerve endings in the intimate parts? It's unfathomable how many nerve endings is there. Why did God, how did he get there? God, why did he put them there? For you to enjoy it within the bounds of a godly marriage. But what happens is we want to pervert it. Let me ask you a question. 
You ever heard anybody go down the road, adultery, fornication, lesbianism, homosexuality, pedophile, sodomy, you keep on naming them. You ever heard anybody go down that road and, and come to the reality of their sin and not be ashamed of their sin? No. I mean, it's always shameful, ain't it? Yeah, it's shameful. The, Romans chapter 6 says, what good did it do us to do the things we're now ashamed of? See, Satan tries to get us to fill these God-given righteous desires with some really sick junk. And he does it. And then he brings shame and says, look what you did. You don't deserve to live. And Jesus come along and said, I'll set you free. And I'll make you whole. And I'll make you new. I'll make you a child of the king. I love what he said. In my daddy's house is a lot of rooms. And I'm going to go set one up for you. I don't know about you, but I think that is neater than a skater. I got a room in the da my father's house. Can you imagine Peter taking somebody on the tour, walking down through there and saying, that right there is Derek's room. Whoo! My kids will always have a room. We're taking Alyssa's bed out of her room. Becky, you know how mamas are. They want to keep the nursery set up to their 25, you know. You know how moms are. She said, well, what if Alyssa wants to come back? I said, honey, I'll tell you what. Guarantee it. If she calls and says she's coming home, I don't care if she's in town. I'll have that bed set up time she gets here. If she wants to come home, I'll tear the dang door off to get her in if that's what it takes. I ain't kicking her out. She'll always have her own. She has a right heart. She's, that's her room. You know what I mean? I got a room in the Father's house. But not everybody's got a room, only those with the right heart. I want to tell you something. There's some times that you want to go home that you can't because you ain't in the right heart. There's a long, long time that I believed in God, but I didn't love him. I loved the world, and I was in direct opposition to God. And if I heard a message like this, I'd have thought the preacher was condemning me. And I wouldn't have perceived it very well. But what I didn't understand is he was trying to tell me how to be set free. How to have a life of joy and happiness. And not crawl up out of the pit one more time. Because you just keep getting in the mud God pulled you out of. And I done it and I done it and I done it and I done it. Until I got so sick of myself I couldn't stand it anymore. I didn't understand that God wasn't trying to be mean. He was trying to be Hosanna. I mean, do you know what the greatest definition of gluttony is? Y'all told me the obvious one, but that's not the greatest definition of gluttony. The greatest definition of gluttony is to fall in love with the luxuries of the world. The greatest definition of gluttony. To be in love with the luxuries of the world. Can we put Proverbs 23, 1 through 5 up on the board, please? Listen to this right here. This is Solomon speaking. He says, when you set to dine with a ruler, note well what's before you. And put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Do not crave his delicacies for that food is deceptive. Don't wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust in your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they're gone. For they'll surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Solomon says when you get invited to the king's house. And you see the throw down. Don't fall in love with what you see. And if you do, put a knife to your throat. Oh, man, what's he talking about there? He's talking about the same thing Jesus was when he said, if your right eye calls you to sin, gouge it out. Or your right hand calls you to sin, cut it off. Don't, don't put a knife to your throat if you feel like overeating. Don't do that. That is definitely not the gist here, all right? If you looked at somebody lustfully, don't poke your eye out. Because as long as you got the other one, you're going to have a major handicap still with that lustful thing. You know what I mean? That, that, you heard that story. That, that preacher's wife was walking across the balcony in the back of the church. And she tripped over her dress tail. Had a one of them big old ball gown looking dress tail. Tripped over her dress tail and fell right over that balcony and held on to the handrail. And the preacher all of a sudden had come to him that anybody that looked up was going to get the blissful view. You know what I mean? And he hollered out, if any man look up, may the Lord cast his eyes out. There's two fellas on the back row, and one of them looked over the other and said, 
I think I'm going to take a chance on my bad eye. You know, Solomon said, be sure that your eyes don't get in love with the delicacies of the world. Because I tell you, they won't pay off. And you say, where are you going with this? Let me tell you something. How do you think it's so easy for them magazines to get a little young girl to, to take them pictures? Why do you think they do it? Because they just want their pictures took naked? They, they make more in 30 minutes than they could in weeks. You know, you, every little girl porn was somebody's little innocent baby girl. You know that, right? Every little girl going to strip in some club tonight was somebody little girl. Every hooker, every call girl was somebody's little girl. But they fell in love with the delicacies of the world. The world could give them more in a moment than they seemed to be able to grasp in a lifetime, but it's all going to go away. That's what he, when Jesus said, what would it do for you to gain the world? He wasn't talking about this big ball we live on. He was talking about the delicacies of the world. If you get all the delicacies of the world and forfeit your soul, what do you got? Back in his day, the prostitute was that very thing. She probably made more money in a day than the rest of the Jews made in a month. But she was broken and empty and an outcast. What about the tax collector? Man, he had some, he, he made the jack. You want to make a jack back in the day, you'd be a Roman tax collector. You'd be rolling in the chips. And every one of them was a thief and a crook. And hated by society. What about today? I mean, isn't it, isn't it tempting to cheat a little bit? Fudge it a little bit? Maybe tell a little, just a white lie, wasn't a black one? I saw that guy, a lame horse. But I told him he was good at math. He was sitting down three and carrying one. You know what I mean? I, I just fudged a little bit. See, that's, you see what I mean? And, and we negotiate our morality. For what we think is an advancement, but it's not. It just takes us further and further away from God and emptier and emptier and emptier and emptier. Let me ask you something. What's it worth to kill babies all day? I mean, how much money would they have to have? Because no matter what the occupation is, if you can set the money, who are you in love with? You see what I mean? If there's a price to buy your spirituality, who are you in love with? You see what? And if you enter the world that way, saying the world ain't got nothing to offer that's worth my Jesus, then your mind's controlled by the Spirit. We talked about Joseph in Sunday school class. Man, I love Joseph. And I want you to understand something, folks. Joseph was tempted in a big time way. Please follow me. When a very attractive woman throws herself at a young man, it's tempting. The reason he did not do it is because he was in tune with God more than he was with his flesh. And that's what we have to be because, hey, it would have been fun for a minute. But it would have been devastating for a lifetime. Can, do you follow me? That Satan was offered a moment of bliss. But it wasn't bliss at all. You understand when Jesus come on the scene, he started pointing out people's sin. They thought he was throwing rock. He wasn't throwing rock. He told that woman at the well, go get your husband. And as soon as he said that, she, he thought she was just one of the rest. Of, he hung her head and said, I don't have a husband. He said, I know. You had five. And the one you got now is not your husband. She tried to turn it off on another subject and he brought it right back. I'm the one. I come to set you free. You don't got to do this junk no more. I want to tell you something, folks. If you're here this morning and you've always been in love with the idea of salvation, but you've never been in love with God to the place that you let go of the world, let me ask you something. What in the world is worth holding on to to deny God? What in the world is worth holding on to? If the Internet separating you away from God, get rid of the junk or put a block on it. If you're in a relationship that's separating you from God, if you can't have them and have God, that ain't love anyway. Go with God. I 
That's right. If your job is keeping you from glorifying God, get another job. You say, well, I can't make as much money. What good would it do for a man to gain the world and forfeit his soul? If you can't glorify God in what you're doing, do something else. It's as simple as that. Jesus said, you either got to love God or love the world. We're going to have a hymn of invitation just here in a short bit, just in a few minutes. I want to ask you something. Are your mind controlled by God? Is your life right now being governed by the will of God or by the will of your flesh, by the cravings of your sin nature and by the feelings of sensuality, which means you do what you feel like doing? Because this is my question. If the church got real and started really talking about life issues, how many kids could be set free if they found out that the way they feel is not the way they got to be? That everybody's got temptation. Everybody's tempted to things they don't want to get up in the front of the room and talk about. Everybody's got temptation, but you only have to stand good for the things that you choose to be governed by. And if you choose to be governed by God, you're not governed by the flesh anymore. Now, I don't know what kind of feelings, desires you go through in your life. I don't know, but I know what kind I've been through, and I don't want to stand up here and talk about it. And I don't have to. Because my God bought them off on Calvary's Hill. He paid for every one of them. I've been set free. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. I struggle with sin every day, but I'm so thankful I'm not who I used to be. And if you're here today and you have no peace inside yourself and you're humiliated with your past, and the sad thing about your past is, is it's still your future. Won't you come to Jesus and let him give you a new future? He'll wipe the slate clean. And you can be as a new creation before a holy God. And if you're here today and you're saved and you say, man, I'm saved and I know I'm saved. But you preach some things today that has killed me. And it's opened my eyes to the reality that even though I am saved, I'm still letting my flesh govern me in many places. Rededicate and ask God to give you strength and lay it down one more time. Paul says, I die daily. Folks, that's what it's about. It's dying daily to the flesh and taking up the cross and following Jesus in submission unto his will. And it's going to be that way. I want to tell you something, church. We need to stop acting like we're in Disneyland and get back to being in the salvation. I heard Adrian Rogers say something this week. I would claim it for myself, but I ain't going to because that's crooked. I heard Adrian Rogers something this week, man. Adrian Rogers is dead and gone with the Lord now. But he said these words. The greatest day in America will be when people get sick of religion and start enjoying salvation. And I'm going to leave it right there. If you have never enjoyed Jesus setting you, salvation, folks, is not about living in sin with some false sense of security. Salvation is about coming to Jesus for him to forgive you of your sin and set you free so that you can have a new life in God. That's salvation. The greatest day in your life. You can't fix America, but your fate's in your hands right now. And the greatest thing you could do is put it in Jesus' hands. The greatest day in your life either was or will be when you get sick of religion and start enjoying salvation. Won't you come as we sing our invitation hymn?